introduce Minister Mitchell without having something that he has sent to us. Because we all know him. Mm -hmm. We all know Fred Mitchell, as he's affectionately called. Mm -hmm. He, what you see is what you get oh, with him. Yeah. What he <laughs> says is what he does. I have known him for a very long time, for many years, and he has been the very same person. Just like how I know that he only has meetings for one hour, and that's it. Wherever you are in the meeting, it's time to go to the hours up. And I also know that he's a man of his word. And whenever you see him come to a podium to speak, you can be assured that you will learn something, that you will be inspired, and you will feel much better about the organization of the Progressive Liberal Party, and much better about yourself and the commitment that you have made to serve this organization. So without further ado, I present to you Minister Mitchell. Thank you. Uh, good evening, uh, everyone. PLP. 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 Amen. Good to see all of you. So the first thing is, uh, they say uh, when you come to the meeting, you shouldn't come with your hands swinging. So that's what you are. Do you want the donation? <laughs> so that's uh, that's three hundred dollars from the party. Oh, that's the Lord. Thank you so much. Thank you. Can you be rich? Just don't switch. Just don't switch. Good evening. So it's a it's a real privilege and pleasure. I was really uh, happy to have been invited to come here to speak this evening and to see old friends and to meet new friends. And uh, it's always a pleasure to come to uh, Freeport and Grand Bahama. Uh, I describe this place as paradise. And uh, one of the starting points uh, for me is always uh, why there hasn't been more growth in this city and island than, than we see. Um, so I'll touch on that a bit and what we need to do. But the first thing I want to mention is that the branch elections are coming up, and I hope that there's wide participation in the branch elections. I was happy to hear that those are going on. I'm just happy that the branch itself is continuing. Uh, the struggle continues. Uh, we have to obviously identify a candidate for this area uh, sooner rather than later. And I imagine there are people, I don't know whether your hat's still, whether you're still planning. Still in. Yes, right. So I'm glad you're still here mm -hmm. and that, you know, people are working the area and just making sure that uh, the presence is here and presence is felt mm -hmm. because we need to have good leadership. Uh, in Grand Bahama, and this yeah, is yeah, one yeah, of the yeah. places where um, there's, there's, a, there's an opening because there's no incumbent. So now's the time to work, to get ourselves established, and uh, keep moving forward. And then uh, the point I was raising, the census figures came out uh, a couple of weeks ago. You may have seen them on the front page of the newspapers. And if I remember correctly, they're saying that the population of the Bahamas grew over the last 10 years, well, the years between 2010, 2010 which is the last uh, census, uh, to the one that was last taken, which was 2021, I guess, was because it was postponed. Uh, anyway, 47, 000, the population of the Bahamas increased by 47,000 people in those 10 years. So that the uh, total population today, or when they took the census, was 399,000 and change. So we're not quite there at 400,000. You may as well say 400,000, but it's 399,000 and change. One of the uh, observations they made is that uh, the population of Grand Bahama declined by 4,000 people in those 10 years, and that Grand Bahama now represents about 11% of the population of the Bahamas. So it's still the second highest population center, but in the 10 years since the last time the census was taken, there's been a decline in the population. And I'm sure that you can reflect that from your own anecdotal evidence. Um, much of that, I would imagine, has to do with Hurricane Dorian and the pandemic 
and the shutdown of the economy as a result of that. But yesterday I was having a conversation with some friends in New Providence uh, because they're looking to buy land in New Providence. A couple of days before that, I was talking to a realtor, Jeff Brown, who is Jeff Brown III, I think. His, his grandfather was a well-known realtor. And he was telling me that there's a difficulty in finding supply of land in order to create land sales and to create houses, build houses for people in New Providence. And um, so one of the last areas in New Providence, of course, is the area in and around Kalani, but land is pretty much drying up for new uh, subdivisions. And the government has face, is facing a critical shortage of housing because, for example, uh, 50 lots uh, went on the market for one of the new government subdivisions, but there are 150 approvals for those 50 lots. How do you divide 150 into 50? And that is a continuing problem uh, everywhere. So the question is, what do you do? Where do people go? Well, the conventional wisdom is that New Providence is overcrowded. You hear people say that all the time. There are too many people in Nassau. And of course, the census now shows that people have drifted to New Providence. Uh, there was a point at which you'd go down to the dock uh, the Potters Key Dock, and you'd see people from Grand Bahama rolling off with their cars and their children and all their worldly goods to take up, a, in my view, a lower quality of life in New Providence than you can have here in Grand Bahama. The, the, the quality of life, in my view, is much better here. Um, less crowded, less crime, um, easier to get around. Uh, so a lot more space, all of those things. So what do you do? Well, as I said, the conventional wisdom is that New Providence is overcrowded, but I tell people that the island of Manhattan in New York is an island which is 13 miles by two, and three million people live on that island. New Providence is 21 by seven, and has a population just about 250,000. So it's not a question of overcrowded. There's a lot you can do. But it requires a change in the way life is organized, which means that when you run out of space this way, you have to create space going that way. So you know, those of you who've been to New York City, you know what New York City looks like. And the late B.J. Nottage and I used to always have a discussion about this. He said, that's not the way I want to live. I want, a, I want a yard, and I want a fence, and I want a garden. That's, what, that's how I want to live. I was telling the uh, same friend we were talking about yesterday how Loftus Roker and I were very good friends. Uh, when, we were, when I was a young man, I'd speak to him almost every day. And so I come home from law school, and my first purchase of a home is a condominium. And I was very proud of the fact that I had purchased this condominium where I was living in, and I was trying to get him to come and see the place where I was staying. So he was excited at first about the fact that I'd bought, I'd bought something in this new home. So I said, and I told him, he said, well, where is it? So I told him it's a condominium. And he goes, condominium? That is nothing. You know, you need to have, a, you have, you need to have land. You, you know, what is that? You know? But that was that generation, an Ackland's man. Uh, and they just believed in land. You gotta have land, and you know, condominium is just a strange thing. You don't do that. You know, you just buy land, have a fence. You gotta have a garden, or you you have to grow stuff. That's that's what it is. And indeed, he lives himself now on something like 10 acres of land back there near the airport. But if you're going to expand the population, uh, clearly, New Providence as an option is going to require building up. And I say to people, I'm saying this because I am a fan of cities. Uh, cities are great places to live. Uh, those who want the rural life, that's fine, uh, the quiet rural life. But if you want an exciting, dynamic life with um, people moving around you all the time, 
And also, when you concentrate people in spaces, there's a lot of money passing hands. So there's a lot of wealth which is concentrated in a city. So a city has a lot to recommend itself for. It's more efficient in, 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 uh, in uh, its services, the services it provides. But when you build a large city, there are some social changes which have to take place, cultural changes. And they have to do with the rules with how you live with one another. The rules on garbage, rules on noise, rules on traffic, um, rules on health care. And they have to be strictly adhered to if the notions of privacy and your own individual space are to be protected. Uh, so a lot of changes. You can't, for example, burn your garbage because if you're living in a condominium, that just doesn't work. If you're going to have pets, there have to be there are certain confines as to how pets uh, uh, are to be organized. So if you don't want that kind of quality of life and you say that that's not what we're going to do with New Providence, then there only is one other option, and that is you got to move to another island. And the question is, if you can move to another island, which island is that going to be? And it seems to me that the most obvious answer has to be Grand Bahama, because the investment is already there in all the roads, all the infrastructure, the buildings, uh, the, uh, the, the, not only the social infrastructure, but the technical infrastructure of how to get permission to build and design and all of that is already there. So the easiest place to do that is Grand Bahama. The question is, why is it not possible to do that? Why is the population declined? The answer is clearly the economy. And there has to be some additional decisions made about how you get a, an uh, economic uh, mass uh, here in Grand Bahama, which will propel the economy going forward. I thought when Edward St. George brought in Hutchison Wampoa that this was the last sort of boost that Grand Bahama needed to just take off because uh, up to that point, things were going along OK with the tourism product. But there was something else which was needed to, to have this kind of critical mass and cash infusion in this economy. And I thought Hutchison provided that with the new port and with the hotel. But that's not proven to be so. You know that there have been reverses in the hotel product as a result of the hurricanes, and I come back to that in a second. And you know that Hutchison, as a result of the disputes with the owners of the Grand Bahama Port Authority, has basically taken a very laid back approach to investment. They are not willing to advance any more cash into the society with partners who have the inability to provide capital to match theirs. And as a result, the city is just in a period of stasis, and there's been, there have been economic reverses here. Now, I mentioned the hurricanes because one of the issues, I've been trying to beat the bush um, on trying to find people to buy the hotels or develop hotels here. And often, people have been looking at the statistics and say, Grand Bahama is in the hurricane zone. And therefore, if you are investing in a product here, you have to know that within five years, there's going to be a severe hurricane, which is likely to affect uh, the product going forward. So there's been some reluctance on that. But you know, uh, the Dutch, uh, they live in a country which is called the Netherlands. Uh, the English call it the lowlands, so Netherlands is actually just lowlands. So Holland and Amsterdam, the Netherlands, are actually below sea level. And um, 
they have a series of dikes and dams along the coast which protects their city and their way of life by these dams. It's an engineering miracle. And they've lived with this for thousands of years. I think thousands of years, at least a thousand years. And they have produced a wonderful country. So given what we know about weather patterns, the answer obviously has to be technology to defend yourself against the weather patterns. Uh, and we know that with climate change and all of that, the weather patterns are getting worse, so on and so forth. But uh, if you design, you, in my view, uh, if you're looking at a 100-year span, if you design, you can defeat those weather patterns because you can predict basically where we're going in terms of those weather patterns, and I think uh, that's the answer to that. But what is required, of course, is the leadership in the city and in the island to attract the investors to come here. Because you have, I was just looking at a building as I was driving up, I think it used to be a nightclub, but I see like the pigeons have taken it over. Uh, with the, is that what it's called, the palace? Yeah, I mean it looks like the pigeons have taken over the roof and trees are growing inside the, inside the building. And all around uh, the city, you find that taking place. And what is astounding is that the people who are responsible for the city's development are basically sitting there uh, telling us that they're doing great things, uh, but these great things don't seem to amount to much because what's happening is you're seeing deterioration all around you. And the question which we as PLPs have to ask ourselves is whether with the failure of the leadership of the owners of the city, it's not time to take a different course. And that means that you have to ask yourself whether or not the present provisions with regard to the Hawksbill Creek Agreement should be allowed to continue going forward as the city deteriorates and the owners of the city are unable to stop it, uh, unable to mobilize the capital, and worse than that, unable to mobilize the ideas. You know, because capital is one thing, but ideas, a lack of ideas, that's, that's the thing which has really caused the problem. Now, People are anticipating two things from us. We promised as a party that we would pay attention to Grand Bahama. When I was in opposition, I would often tell Peter Turnquist, the solution is money on the ground. And you know that money makes the world go round. And you also know that I've said, and I say again, there's nothing in Grand Bahama and nothing in New Providence that I see that cannot be solved by money. There's no complicated problem or issue here that cannot be resolved by money. Uh, in the longer term, there's, going to, there's a need for a massive infusion of capital. We've already announced the uh, refurbishment of the airport, and a mistake was made by the last administration by simply rep not repairing that airport right away because you lost the pre-clearance as a result of it, and the Americans are saying they're not going to bring it back. But we should have simply just repaired the airport, gotten it back and going, the same way they ultimately, we had to do it to repair the uh, now international terminal uh, at the airport. Should have just done it. But stall, delay, and defer, <coughs> And then, of course, they weren't willing to put the money in it. What they wanted to do was to take the insurance money and run. One of the most amazing things uh, we found is the announcement that uh, there's an application to raise your water rates. And the water rates require an application from Caesar to Caesar. So you take your hat off. Here, I'm the owner of the Water Corporation. And I put my hat on as the regulator named the Grand Mahan Port Authority. And I asked myself, should I give you permission to raise the water? 
And uh, then I say, I look in the mirror and I say, mm, let me think about it. I think so. I'm going to raise the water. That's essentially what it uh, boils down to. Um, last time we had that kind of action, Stafford Sands was the Minister of Finance and responsible for gaming in the Bahamas. And he went into the ca cabinet and uh, he was also the lawyer for the Grand Baham Port Authority and the Bahamas Amusement. Uh, he went into the cabinet, took his uh, hat off, or uh, put his hat on as Minister for Gaming. Should I give the Grand Bahama Port Authority and Bahama Amusements a license? Uh, well, I'm the lawyer. I take that hat off, put my hat on as lawyer, and says, I think so, I will. <laughs> and he got a fat uh, half a million dollar fee for doing so, even as a Minister of the Government. So there's a problem with Caesar appealing to Caesar. So for all of those reasons, you have to be looking at a new public policy. And I think people are getting a little impatient with us over this issue. Uh, Michael Manley used to say, it's impatient of debate. It's staring you right in the face, what you have to do. And it only takes the question of courage, uh, because um, never mind how it seems obvious. The moment you do it, there'll be plenty of people running around saying, oh, the PLP is trying to grab people's private affairs, and on and on and on and on, even though the city is suffering as a result of what now exists. So that has to be medium to long term. And the prime minister is already engaged, I can assure you, in efforts to try and resolve that problem, that policy problem. In the short term, though, what I found when I came here last year in November and spoke to our men's branch, which is largely a branch of male small businessmen and contractors, uh, is that there was the expectation, and there is, this is not a unique problem to Grand Bahama, there was and is an expectation that small businessmen and contractors would have a steady stream of work coming from the government to keep them going. So in many of the previous terms that we had, small contractors were getting every month or so $30,000, $40,000 contracts, which would roll over from time to time. And you keep a set of employees going, and people would have some money to keep their businesses going. Um, that hasn't materialized. And uh, except for the Minister for Grand Bahama's beautiful Grand Bahama program, which provided some infusion of cash to, uh, the, the, to that sector that I'm talking about, uh, I am an advocate of setting aside, again, special monies to do just that. I think the complaints are too much. There's too much noise. Uh, the government is being so successful in other areas, but there's just too much noise on that issue. And you know, it's like this. Uh, you can't explain to your children who are five and six years old why there's no food in the refrigerator. I mean, you could explain all you want, but five, five and six years old, it, you know, it doesn't cut it. They just need the food to eat. So that's where we are with this right now, is that you can explain away what is happening. And I, I can tell you what is happening uh, at the macro level, is that there's been a decision taken in the Ministry of Finance to stop all borrowing, to uh, ease the cash flow issues which the country has. Uh, there's been a huge um, increase in the subsidies to the public corporations, which are largely unbudgeted, BPL being the major one. Um, I think it was something like $150 million that the government suddenly had to pay over the last year to make sure the fuel bills are paid. Uh, just recently, there's another $20 million which just popped up uh, unbudgeted, and the Treasury has to meet those payments. So as a result of these transfer payments, um, cash flow is just tight. So you see these figures in the press about how we are doing so well in terms of revenue collection. All of that is correct, 
but expenses have grown exponentially as a result of these transfer payments. Now you only have two solutions. Uh, either you go back to people and tax them to get the money, or you borrow. And we've decided to do neither. What we've decided to do is to just pay out of cash flow. And when you pay out of cash flow, it reminds me of um, those Sunday mornings I used to go with my grand aunt to the clapboard houses on Hawkins Hill to collect the rent. And you know, people come to the door and she's saying, pay the rent. And they're saying, Ms. Dell, I got it this week. I only have $20. Here, take this, see what you can do, put that on it. So that's what the Treasury's doing now. As bills come due, the cash flow allows you to pay this and this and this, and that's what we do. And we have to do that because what they're trying to do is to maintain the credit space for the country because hurricane is coming. Nobody's going to help us if something goes wrong, and you've got to just have the credit space to be able, if you have to borrow, to do so. So it's a real tough time that we're in. And that's what we're explaining, but as I said, you know, uh, the grass is growing green, but the horse is starving. So my feeling is that um, we need to do something in the next budget cycle to try and resolve that problem for these small contractors because there's a great deal of uh, faith that the meanness which existed during Minnesota's administration would be removed and that there'd be more lubrication in the system uh, for, those, for that group of people. And so that's what the internal arguments are going on now. There was a budget meeting uh, this afternoon in the cabinet because you know that the, the budget is to be presented uh, in a couple of weeks' time. And hopefully some of these ideas will find their way into the public policy. So there can be some money on the ground because it is, it is really a cri critical pro problem. And even though it isn't so obvious in New Providence because of the mass of the population, the issues are the same. Um, I, as chairman of the party, you know, I get to speak to people across the country. And I got a call today from uh, Central Andros, from our branches in Central Andros. And they're just beside themselves with this because there's just not the spending which they expected. Uh, same thing down in Acklands. Um, and the payments that are coming just on the way they should be. Um, so there's a lot of complaining. And the best way I know how is to, on occasions like this, acknowledge these complaints. To say we are not tone deaf to what is happening. And trying as best we can to juggle the balls in the air to try and see what we can do uh, to resolve uh, these issues. So that's the explanation for it. Uh, hopefully there'll be some relief on the way sooner rather than later. Um, and just know that um, we, we're just not tone deaf, that we actually I think we know what is, what is going on. And the pain which uh, is felt by uh, people around the country on this uh, subject. And um, I say to people that there's an expression I use, which is, if you have your voice, and the voice is all you have, then use your voice. Because it's important. No, don't, don't mind, you know, people get uncomfortable because you speak. If that's an issue, we've got to know what the issue is. There's no point in, in an organization not saying these are the issues. Uh, because sooner rather than later, we face a general election. And the issues will come up anyway, because those who are not in our party are simply going to tell us. You know, uh, a lady, I remember, what was it the 20, 2007 election, had the view that I, as public service minister then, could do promotions. Uh, for her, and she didn't get a promotion before uh, she retired that she wanted. And I walked up to the yard. She'd always been an Arthur Hanna's faithful supporter from Kemp Road, had voted PLP all the time. And when I walked in the yard, she said, do not come in my yard. Do not come in my yard. You were supposed to get this promotion for me. You didn't. 
Uh, so I don't need to see you, and I won't be voting for you. And she said it just like that. And that's the way life is. Uh, people support us because they believe that they will get something in return. Um, that may seem crass, but as simple as that. Everybody joins up because there's a bargain, and they expect their lives to be better, not worse. So that's the, that's the news. The good news is that there's a lot of planning uh, for many things in investment. I was really surprised, uh, I'll stop here, um, we were, there was a lady who was uh, put out of uh, place in Port Lucaya a couple of weeks ago. And uh, so uh, between uh, Ginger Moxie and myself, we spoke to the owners at Port Lucaya to see if we could get her restored to her business, uh, which, uh, which they did. Uh, but um, in the process, they sent me um, a copy of the notice which the people of Port Lucaya sent to all of the tenants in Port Lucaya. And it said something like this, uh, as of the 1st of May, you have to pay the rent, the full rent. There's no more uh, discount on the rent. The economy in Grand Bahama is now recovered. There are lots of tourists around. Um, they're coming to Port Lucaya, so you don't need any more breaks. And furthermore, you don't have 14 days to pay anymore. You only have a week to pay and the VAT is also going to be added. Um, but the thing that caught my attention is things are, you know, the tourists are coming back, the economy is recovered, so you don't need a break. And that's the perception of the owners of Port Lucaya. So I only tell you, you may be living in one world and they're living in another world, but that's the world they live in. Uh, so uh, we've got a lot of work to do. I thank you for all uh, that you do. I'm happy to be here at this meeting. And of course, if you have anything you want to say to me, I'd be happy to entertain that. So thanks a lot very much. Thanks.